Hello everyone. Welcome to the Sustainable Development eTalk series co-hosted by CNS and the Indian Institute of Management Indore. We have with us today a formidable panel of three gusty women and one man who are waging a relentless war against breast cancer in their own special ways. We have Dr. Pooja Ramakant, a noted breast cancer surgeon and she's additional professor in the Department of Endocrine Surgery, King George's Medical University. We have Dr. Lopa Mudra Das Roy, who founded the Breast Cancer Hub, and she has done extensive research on the connect between breast cancer and arthritis. We also have the mother and son duo of Peggy and Brett Miller from the Male Breast Cancer Coalition. And one name, one more name, the star name, I will reveal later on. Uh, they will provide us with a reality check on preventing breast cancer and averting untimely deaths. Greetings, everybody. On behalf of the students of Indian Institute of Management Indore, I am honored to welcome Dr. Pooja Ramakant, Dr. Lopamudra Das Roy, and Brett and Peggy Miller to today's STG Talks. We are indeed looking forward to educating ourselves on the nuances and impacts of breast cancer. Now, I take the privilege of welcoming and inviting Ritu Bhatia, a good friend of ours who's a trained microbiologist turned health journalist and writer. Too many caps she's wearing. And I invite her to open today's session with her message, sharing her personal tryst with this emperor of all maladies. Over to you, Rituji. Thank you, and uh, thank you so much for including me in this wonderful event uh, with so many eminent researchers and, you know, wonderful uh, talkers. It's such a pleasure. Yeah. So the thing is that when I was diagnosed with breast cancer last year, it was a shock for several reasons. Uh, I think one of the reasons it was a special shock was because I've worked on campaigns uh, for breast cancer all my life for all the women's magazines. So I never expected that I would be in a position that of, you know, stories I wrote. But, you know, there you are. And uh, it's been eight months since then and a long journey of treatment. Uh, I'm still undergoing radiation therapy. I'm nearly at the end of my long journey uh, and I'm doing well. And I feel that I just wanted to share a few, few important lessons I'd learned from this journey in the hope that it might help other women with my disease. So the thing is, if you're, in, if you're in my position, then there's prevention hasn't happened and you're diagnosed with a tumor and then you're stuck with your tumor. Uh, and I think the first most important thing is not to let your tumor define That's where a patient has to say, no, you know what? I'm not a statistic. Uh, it's not necessary. There are treatments. It's a disease. And I think it's, that's really important to remember. It's a disease like any other disease, right? And there are treatments for it. They're not easy, but they exist. And I think we're lucky to be here in a time when we have all these treatments. That's the first thing. Second thing is that I feel every woman with this disease must make her own treatment choices. It's really important to take control of your treatment because, you know, the minute you say, let the cancer take me, uh, I think you're lost. And I think it's been really exciting for me to plan my own treatment, to decide which doctor I felt comfortable with, to decide what I felt comfortable with. And every minute of the day, I make decisions. What should I eat? What should I drink? If I have this side effect, what do I think I can do about it? You know, and treatment can include, I've opted for conventional medical treatment, but I've also included a lot of healing options, which are unconventional. I have massage therapy, uh, a lot of meditation, uh, you know, herbal therapy. So it's nice to create a plan, which is uniquely for you. That's the second thing I really want to emphasize. Take treatment in your, in your hands and uh, take active kind of uh, uh, control of that tumor. Say, okay, you know what? I'm going to work with you, not work against you. And the last thing I want to say is that I think the, the healing environment is really primary to 
everything. I created a what I consider a really warm, supportive environment for myself in my home. And surrounded by people and friends who all in a nice network who were all constructive and helping. You know, each one played a specific role. And that was so wonderful. One was very good at cooking and would bring me food. The other was good at driving and would, you know, take me for a hospital trip. Overall, the, the feeling of being loved and, and, you know, looked after was really important to my healing. Uh, and I would, say, I, would, uh, I would say that every woman or man is capable of doing that. Just say I want to be in a constructive space. I don't want to be around people who are going to pull me down in any way. And so these are the things that I feel have contributed well to my doing well during treatment, touch wood, uh, doing well and, and being able to be positive, constructive. And now, you know, actually I want to advocate for this, uh, for breast cancer. It's strange that I should be in this position, but that's where I am. Uh, and I hope I can do more or, you know, share more in the future. And I welcome all of you and look forward to listening to what you have to say about prevention, especially during this time of COVID and, uh, you know, all the path that lies ahead in groundbreaking cures and things like that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rituji. And uh, uh, coping with this, uh, uh, during these times of COVID-19 must have posed so many other challenges, which perhaps you may like to talk uh, about later on. But uh, you have really set the stage in a very positive way for today's session. And I now hand over the mic to Dr. Pooja Ramakant to share her doctor's perspective on breast cancer. Over to you, Pooja. Thank you, Shoa Madam. And uh, hello to all people who are part of this webinar and uh, have joined us today. And uh, I really thank you and appreciate Rituji who had spoken so well. And I could gather three important points which she said. One was she herself said that prevention was not an option for her. It was just diagnosis and then treatment. So you realize there is an importance of prevention and prevention plays a very, very big role before we reach to that stage of diagnosis, if we can avoid that or avoid that. So reality checks are very important, which I shall be discussing about. Other important point which she highlighted was to make decisions. Decisions making is not just only while undergoing treatment, it may be before treatment and even to avoid the diagnosis or the avoid the creation of the cancer cells in our body. So those important decisions are very valuable in deciding whether we can prevent this monster or we cannot. Third thing what she said important was a healing environment, to have a positive environment around us. These three things are really important as right now for her and it is important for each one of us every day of our life so to talk about prevention i set the ball rolling with these three important points which she has highlighted and then we shall be discussing about and as she said she is not in statistics so i won't be talking about statistics but like today's world is evidence informed and evidence based treatment so everybody has a right to know what is the evidence available. Why am I giving those treatment options? What is the importance of choosing those options? How do you make that choice? So for that, definitely you need statistics and data around it. But definitely at the end, it is a human touch which we have and it is not the data alone. Why are we talking about prevention? That is the most important crux of this whole next 15 minutes and the webinar keeping in this topic. Because you see in India, majority, we see 70% patients present in locally advanced stage, which is unlike the West where most are very screen detected, very tiny early breast cancers. So in India per se, we have to first bring down from locally advanced stage, change it to early stage, and then talk about prevention and screen detected things. So it is just a step ladder thing, but uh, we have to know about prevention to make our progress faster because still we are lacking behind that uh, we have not reached even the early stage or screen detected tiny cancers which happen in few fortunate people and survival depends on the stage so if it is early stage it has the best survival there are other factors also affecting it but stage is a very important factor and uh, there are many factors which are really in control of us 
like healthy diet and exercise can reduce chances of breast cancer by nearly 40%. And when it is caught early stage, breast cancer has up to 98% survival. So that is a very good survival rate it has. And majority of these cancers are not genetic, like 85 to 90% genes are not really involved so that means there's some environment this tumulus in the environment which causes some trigger in the cancer cells to grow okay so i'll just see the results yes. and then we will move uh, further okay so do you know about breast self-examination so 40 percent have said yes and 44 no and then few not sure have you ever done self-examination? So yes is 29% very less. Majority have not done it. Those who have done, do you do it weekly, monthly, yearly? Okay, all figures are there. Never done as majority. Does diet play a role? Majority have said yes. And 55%. But 40% have said not sure. And 3% some have said no. And is breast cancer mostly familiar in majority of the patients? 33% have, so one third, one third, one third each. Okay, so you realize these are very important uh, questions which we have discussed. And uh, I hope at the end of uh, next 10 minutes, these uh, answers will change because that's what is going to change our thinking about breast cancer and our lives. So, Continuing further, the benefits of early detection and timely diagnosis is, as we talked, better survival rates. The treatment is simpler. We can conserve the breast. We don't have to remove the whole breast. Even we may avoid chemotherapy, which is the most dreaded part of the treatment. Because, and compared to early stage, late stage, the survival is poor. The treatment is more complicated. We have to add a lot of chemotherapies, hormonal therapies, radiation therapy, surgery or a targeted therapy, so it adds to extra cost and complications related to it. Many patients, unfortunately, they uh, suffer from the complications and they die because of toxicity, because of the treatment instead of the disease per se. And then majority women lose their breasts, or if it happens in the male, they lose their whole breast. So to avoid, uh, it's just like an amputation of an organ, to remove, if we can avoid that, then we have to be in the early stage or the earliest possible stage. So this, this is diagram is a simple way to understand that uh, we have got breast precursor cells, which are normal cells, which don't convert into cancer cells. But when some trigger happens in the environment, that stimulus causes change inside that cell, that's a cancerous change, and then the cell multiplies not in two, but in much more than two. And then each cell keeps on multiplying and multiplying and forms cancers. And this is how cancers grow. So if we can avoid that stimulus, which is going to stimulate that change, we can change the whole scenario. There are certain things which are in our hand and which we should know about it. And we, because that is going to make the right choices. So first is a lifestyle prevention. Lifestyle modification includes everything. And I start with the diet because majority people said, some said diet has no role. Some said we don't really know. Even I didn't know much about it. But as you learn and read more and more things about it, you realize the importance of what you eat and what you should eat and what you should not eat. And the sooner we realize that, the better it is for each one of us. The carbohydrate rich diet is linked with a lot of cancers. Breast cancer is one of them. So if we are eating a lot of white sugar things, white sugar, white flour, anything that is rich in carbohydrates, that may stimulate that trigger. So ideally, we should be eating protein rich and bit of fat and bit of carbohydrate. I say, I don't say total no carbs, but then it should be small in amount. And our diet, whatever we eat, everything has got some amount of carbohydrates. So if we write what we are eating the whole day and calculate, for ourselves, we will be surprised or we will be shocked of how much we are extra we are eating. And then we can cut down on the carbs and we can add those foods which are rich in protein. And the studies say up to 50% of our diet should be raw. It should be uncooked. So that is much more healthy than cooking because when we cook the proteins, they are killed in the heat. 
So even if we take a protein rich diet and that is overcooked, the proteins are not there. So that way it is harming us instead of giving benefits. Other thing is exercise. Exercise is not just about physical well-being. It is mental, emotional, spiritual, every way it helps. It releases a lot of endorphins and the hormones which give us the positive energy and we feel good about ourselves and it really helps. So if we have an active lifestyle, then that also doesn't let the cancer cells to grow. If you're living a sedentary lifestyle, now they say sitting is next smoking. So if you're sitting uh, for longer hours, more than 30 minutes, if you're sitting continuously and we're not moving around, so then that also stimulates these cells to grow. If we are on the obese side, our body mass index is on the higher side, then that also triggers it. If we have a lot of stress, we have a lot of anxiety, then also the hormones are released in our body, which may trigger these cancer cells to grow. And then apart from the diet, I'll talk about the environmental pollutants. There are a lot of environmental pollutants around us or what we eat or what we drink or what we wear, which also stimulates cancer cells. Many are like example, phthalates, plasticizers, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. They are present in the cosmetics. They are present as pesticides or they are present in the plastics. If we use microwave cooking and we cook the stuff in the plastic, the plastic comes in touch of heat and it melts and that releases these uh, environmental pollutants and then that also triggers cancers. So the way we our lifestyle dwells around things. If we eat organic food and we ensure that there's no pesticides are in it, then that also can be prevented. You can, there are a lot of studies on the water which has been near the waste, which has been thrown from the factories, outlets, or there has got a lot of contaminants. And then on the villages or the area nearby, people living, they get more cancers. There are few studies which say hair dyes, the chemicals we use, like in the cosmetics, they are also linked with certain amounts of causing cancers. So all these things are called endocrine disrupting compounds because they change hormones in our body. Then alcohol and smoking in any amount is associated with cancer. So there are certain risk factors which we should know about it, but maybe we may not be able to change some, but we should have the information about it. Estrogen is a hormone which causes the cancer cells to grow. So it's not uh, really good in that way, but estrogen has benefits. It protects the bones, so it is not really bad, but it has that side effect. So if the lady has early menarche, she has early periods which happen before nine or 10 years of age when she is in childhood, or she has a late menopause, it, uh, periods continue beyond 60 years of age, then a lot of estrogen is there in the body and that drive causes cancers. If the lady has not given birth to a child, and she has not breastfed, then, that, then also these estrogenic drives are higher in those women and then that also may trigger cancer cells to grow. So breastfeeding is protective in that way. Family history is definitely there, but that constitutes five to 10% genetic. So if somebody has family history, they should go for genetic tests available and then they can come to know whether it's hereditary or not. Then advancing age per se is a risk factor for cancers. Any exposure to radiation, to especially to the chest, is a risk factor. Then if we take hormones, if we consume them either as oral contraceptive pills or we take as hormone replacement therapy in postmenopausal women, then there is a slight chance of stimulating these cancer cells. So prevention can be either in the form of lifestyle prevention, which I have talked about it. Then it can be in the form of medicines or it can be in the form of surgery. There are certain anti-estrogen medicines available, which is prescribed to only a selected subset of people who really are candidates for having this, who have strong family history. And then they take those anti-estrogen tablets for five years or 10 years or whatever is the prescribed period. And that prevents cancers if they have a very high risk. And then you all may be knowing about Angelina Jolie, who had undergone seven or eight series of surgeries, her, both the breasts were removed, both ovaries were removed, and her, she was genetically positive. She lost her mother, grandmother, and she didn't want to lose herself because she had children. And she said, I, I want to see my grandchildren. So she underwent prophylactic surgery as a preventive measure for not getting cancer. 
so that surgical prevention is up to 80 to 90 percent so, but that is only for women who are genetically positive not for majority of the population then if now if somebody says how will i know whether i have the high risk of getting cancer or i have a moderate risk or i have a low risk of getting breast cancer how do i know about it so there are a lot of models available freely on google you can see gale example is just one of them which i am quoting it asks you very simple questions that at what age did you get the menarche uh, is some relative of yours has got breast cancer if, if they got cancer at what age did they get it so when you fill all these simple questions at the end it tells your risk if your relative risk is higher of getting a cancer you may go for screenings or risk preventive options if your risk is low you can learn about self-examination and be aware about it so you must use each one must use these models because they're freely available and they're quite informative then how do we detect early very important is breast self-examination with most women have don't do as the questions also were there and more men including because we don't lay so much of emphasis on these preventive options and even if when we talk about it the majority of women say we are not confident in examining ourselves so we have to learn how to examine our breast so that we know that any change is happening immediately we report to a doctor so when we are taking a shower we examine our breast in a clockwise direction with the flat of our fingers then we stand in front of the mirror and we see standing both the breasts are the same or there's any change one is bigger or smaller or one is lift it up or there's some change in the skin some change in the nipple then we lift our hands up so that we see any change underneath which may be hidden when we are not uh, raising the limb then we examine even in the lying down position also and then we look for the nipple and just press it and see if there's no discharge coming and this self examination should be done every month at the end of the menstrual cycles after 20 Five thirty years of age by all women so then if they examine their breast every month they come to know any change which is happening at the earliest but we ignore it but we sh should not ignore it and we should pass this information to others also because this also doesn't involve any costs this is also the models are freely available you can download it you can use it freely and you keep a diary and you keep noting it so this is a very important check it's a very simple method to do clinical examination can be done by a doctor which may be required in high-risk women or women who have some problems related to breast or they have some issues or concerns doing self-examination it can be done six monthly intervals and imaging in the form of mammogram which is recommended once in two years after 40 years of age and once every year after 50 years of age these guidelines are us and other centers not in india we do in india we have opportunistic screening women who come forward for imaging they undergo those imagings so uh, uh, imaging is important but uh, screening is debatable in breast cancer so i'm not going in that but it is good to do self-examination and clinical examination by a doctor and whenever there is some any concern we can go forward for imaging so what can we do as individual to create awareness about breast cancers we should talk about it like right now we are doing we can have webinars we should have discussions among our officials office colleagues among our family members among our friends so that people are more confident in talking about it and they're not hesitant we should write about it have role plays to make it more interesting patient support group is the very important aspect so that people don't feel stigmatized or they don't feel alone in this battle they have a strong support system we can have awareness walks to create awareness we can have billboards advertise we can educate school children and college uh, young people also because they are the torch bearers of passing on the information in their family and the environment and the neighbors around themselves we can collaborate with social workers and the ground level workers to cover each and every corner it's not just the urban areas we should cover the rural areas all the areas the information should go as far as we can spread it so we in KGMU have done some breast cancer awareness walks we do in October month, but it should not be confined to a month. It should be done at regular basis. 
we have done billboards and we advertise in front of our outpatient clinic so that when patients are sitting they may see those boards and they may realize that they need a self examination or clinical examination and they may approach us and areas like airports bus stands uh, Uh, the railway stations, all the crowded places, we had put the billboards so that people just read and they see, and they some thought may stimulate them to learn about it. So just knowing about the cancer is not enough. We need to get first ourselves informed, and then we need to pass this information to others. So with this, I just uh, have the take-home message that uh, stay healthy, eat healthy, make the right choices in what you are eating. It's very important. exercise regularly exercise can be in the any form whatever you can do it can be yoga it can be walking it can be jogging running cycling swimming just climbing staircases whatever you want to do you can do that helps a lot do self examinations every month have knowledge information about breast cancer don't be scared or ignorant about it and uh, help others also to deal with it and uh, create more and more information and awareness about it so with this i thank you all and i'm happy to have any questions or concerns if you have listening to this thank, thank you. you very much pooja thank you very much for making us aware of all the do's and don'ts uh, of breast cancer our next speaker is dr lopa mudra das roy uh, welcome lopa uh, and uh, lopa could you tell us something about your research on uh, the connect yes. between arthritis and breast cancer and, and also about the breast cancer hub which you have found yeah absolutely first and foremost thank you very much uh, you know shobha ma'am and also mr bobby ramakan uh, and cns and i am uh, for inviting me and it was really a pleasure listening to mr riku ji and also dr pooja ramakan we have almost covered uh, with the preventative measures right so before i go into the research part i would just like to start with a story that um, what actually like as you covered dr pooja that the most important thing what i feel through my experiences because of which we started the breast cancer hub is that the taboo and the ignorance and that's why the tagline that we created is break the breast taboo and i would like to start with a story that even last year so i did like i do extensive for uh, the breast cancer hub extensive cancer screening all across india in the villages in the cities and then what um, one story like last year in a village in assam and i just finished my session and i saw an 18 year old girl crying and she told me that um, you know madam why didn't you come to my village last year because my mother just died of breast cancer because she was not aware that a lump could be cancer and also she was shy to talk about it and you know that i felt so bad because this is the scenario i face everywhere even when i went to mumbai a uh, metastatic breast cancer patient comes up to me and says like wish you were here earlier because i was diagnosed late because i didn't even want to talk to my husband about it so this is the main scenario what i feel is because the topic is about averting untimely death so i really request everyone you know to speak up and be bold and discuss within ourselves because it is our responsibility to translate the message that a painless or painful lump any discharge could be cancer visit the doctor immediately and of course like now coming to the preventative measures dr pooja has covered mostly everything and uh, but I just want to talk about diet a little bit like we always say like you know eat healthy but what actually happens inside our body from a scientific perspective our body is like there are free radicals which damage the dna of the cell which kind of causes the you know like abnormal cell growth but why do we say we have to eat healthy rich antioxidant rich diet because the antioxidants will help to balance the free radical which will stop the you know the free radicals to go and damage the cells in the same way that like stress stress is definitely a master regulator for many oncogenic signaling and that's why i always say like if you don't want to run on a treadmill do what you love to do you need to what love to dance just dance you know feel like because that is like releasing your stress and also a way of exercising because exercising helps to boost the immune system especially in the covid-19 environment irrespective you know like whether you are a cancer patient a thriver or you are at high risk exercise daily really helps 
see my screen. So actually the key risk factors uh, we have already covered and um, Dr. Puja has very well covered too. Now, why I ask the question of inflammation? So that's where my research comes into play. Now inflammation, we all know that, you know, it's uh, it plays a dual role. Like it's kind of like, it's very much essential because our immune system or it's, an, it's a kind of immune response that heals the body. But also when inflammation goes out of control, it also damages the body. <coughs> And one of the main inflammatory conditions in our body is arthritis. And that's where, you know, I won't go into the deeper level, but on a surface level, that's what my research was. We got press release in American Association of Cancer Research in 2012, where we discovered the link between arthritis and breast cancer. And we found that when we have arthritis and if we have breast cancer, then the progression of cancer is much faster. That means the metastasis. Metastasis means when the tumor cells are going to the distant organs. It is fa much faster because of many pro-inflammatory cytokines and that's the signaling path we mm -hmm. discovered. We don't want to go into details about that. But the reason why I want to bring this up is that we always ignore like the other, other conditions in the body when we are going through cancer. And that's where I would request like, you know, the cancer patients or survivors, any individual suffering from any kind of disease, please, when you visit the doctor, speak up about it, about your other underlying condition. Because when we inflammation, what happens is that it, it actually orchestrates the microenvironment of the tumors and helps in the proliferation and the migration. So it's not only we target cancer, it, we also need to target the pathway, you know, which is causing the inflammation, which will help in the prognosis, lowering the effect of the progression of cancer. And that is something that I wanted to talk. And it's not only arthritis, there are so many other underlying inflammatory conditions, like it's maybe asthma, it may be other conditions, which if you're having this, it's very essential that we definitely, there is a drug therapy for sure. But also I would request that, you know, we follow in general, if you can see my screen, in general, you follow the, uh, maybe if I can. In general, if we can follow a diet, which is an anti-inflammatory diet, we would say like targeting inflammation. And you know, like uh, the, as uh, Dr. Puja mentioned that about this food aggravating inflammation and sugar, carbohydrate is all interlinked because they all inflame, they're inflammatory, uh, they kind of, um, they kind of upregulate the inflammatory pathway. And the way we can actually curb the inflammation through a natural food, which is like turmeric, which is like the onion, garlic, ginger, all fresh, avoid the processed food. Even like nowadays in the market, we find the ginger powder, the garlic powder. But I always tell everyone, you know, like, like especially turmeric, ginger, we should buy fresh turmeric roots from the market and use that in our diet rather than using the powder stuff which is available. Everything fresh, spices, you know, our Indian culture is like rich in spices, make the spices at home. These things really help. So cartilage inflammation is a very important factor with cancer progression. And that is what my research was about. And one of the, one of the areas of my research that I wanted to bring it up as uh, Shobha ma'am had asked, asked me to do that. Now, um, I know Dr. Puja mentioned about the genetic mutations and I understand a lot of women tell me that Lopa, you know, we have followed everything. We lived a healthy lifestyle. You know, we followed so many, like uh, we ate healthy, we did exercise and why did we get cancer? And I mean, it's very sad because sometimes like five to 10%, only five to 10% is genetically inherited. And when we have like ovarian cancer, breast cancer in our family, we really have to be proactive about it. And as you can see, there are two types of genes, which are called BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, which are very, uh, like, these are the two main ones, and there are many other genes also, which we can look into. But one thing I always want to request is we cannot forget the men of the family. Whenever it comes to genetics, we should not be thinking about women alone because the gene can be carried by the men too. If in a family you see that, you know, women are carriers of the gene, the men should be tested too. And I'm, I'm a, the breast cancer hub works for both breast cancer and women and men. And I'm not going to discuss about men because I know like Brett and Peggy from Male Breast Cancer Coalition are here. So they are going to talk about it. But we collaborate with Male Breast Cancer Coalition because 
I totally believe that, you know, equally, like the way we focus on women, we also should focus on the men. And also when we do genetic testing for men, they're not only if they are carrying the gene of BRCA, they're not only prone to prostate cancer and breast cancer, but also other type of cancer. So these things, I wanted to highlight the aspects which are not so known, so that's why it's very important we focus on that too. Now, with the screening, as Dr. Puja mentioned, definitely breast cell exam from a young age of 17, 18, because in India recently, like this year when I went, I met a woman, 22 year old with breast cancer. And she had no idea, no one in her family, because 90% can randomly happen. Because it doesn't have to be, the family history is very less, like five to 10, the rest it can happen randomly. But I also asked a question that is that, you know, do mammograms miss tumor in the beginning? Because when we think of breast cancer screening, it's breast self examination, clinical examination, and then the gold standard is mammogram. We never go beyond mammogram. But do we know that mammograms can also miss 50% of the chances of tumors if we have a condition which is called breast, a dense breast tissue? So I'll just, I'm just going to explain in a very layman term to be easy to understand like what is mammogram? Mammogram is actually x-ray of the breast. When we have mammogram, it, our, our breast looks like this. It's totally black because of like a type of tissue called fatty tissue. But our breast also contains another type of tissue, which is known as fibroglandular tissue or dense breast. When we have dense breast, it, it in the image appears as white patch like this. If we have heterogeneous dense breast, it will be all scattered white like this. If we have extremely dense breast, it will be all white like this. Why am I talking about dense breast? Because when we have tumor, the tumor appears as a white dot. As you can, and my arrow is pointing here. But if we have dense breast, it's like, you know, the tumor is lost in the white background. And that is how 50% of the cases with dense breast, like if I am lucky, you know, my tumor may be here. But if I'm not lucky, my tumor may be here. And that's why mammograms may miss the tumors with dense breast. And trust me, in these two years when I was doing all the outreaches, I met around 10 women we detected after the session when they saw this slide, they came to me and they said, I can feel my lump. I did mammogram, it came negative, but my lump is growing. When they went for ultrasound, so the supplementary test can be 3D mammogram, which is more advanced, or ultrasound. And mostly, like you know, Asian women, uh, then African American women, Caucasian, mostly all population of women, 50% of the cases, chances are we may have dense breast. That's why breast self exam is always important because we need to know our own breast. That way, we know that even if we feel something, that we are aware about it. So I hope this was uh, some information like when you're going for mammogram, please ask the doctor, do I have dense breast? Because it is your body, you have the right to know about what is going on in your body. Now, as um, Shobha Ma'am has mentioned, like to talk a little bit about Breast Cancer Hub, because so I um, I resigned from my job in 2017 and I'm doing everything pro bono like for the last two and a half years, because that is where I wanted to was, I used to, I, it used to kill me whenever I was, would meet women, I would meet oncologists who would tell me women present so late in the developing countries. And that's when I felt that maybe there's something missing, which is the information. And that's why we founded Breast Cancer Hub, is to connect the developed and developing country and, and to capture those areas which were never tapped earlier. So not only in US, in India, like we do extensive work in India too. And we develop like in collaboration with Male Breast Cancer Coalition and Sarah Cannon Cancer Institute, we have the breast self exam card. And you see the pink here and the blue here. The pink is actually for women and the blue is for men. And we have it now in 17 languages. It's available on the website, on both MDCC website and also on our Breast Cancer Hub website. And then we have it in 11 Indian languages. And thankfully, to, thanks to all my network of BCH volunteers who helped with the translation. So please download the card of your language, circulate in your network, because this piece of paper will really help save life because early detection is the key to cancer. Now, we also do a lot of research, mostly on the epidemiological study, because what we are trying to do is bring, the, because when, when I'm traveling, I know that I meet the doctors, but they tell me, like, this is the representation. 
if we are doing the uh, Google search, we don't get the real representation of what is happening in the developing countries. That's why I'm trying to go in depth, collaborating with the oncologist, with the gynecologist, so that you know we can bring into picture the actual scenario in the developing countries with research with breast cancer. Also adopting villages. Remember I told you the story about this girl last year and this is the picture of the girl over here and we adopted her village. So I promised myself that you know no more death from breast cancer from that village and she is a big advocate now. So you know this is how we are trying to do is now go before it was like I did around 160 outreaches last year. We distributed the breast cell exam card because in, in the developing countries people there are two things. It's the culture inertia even how many of our moms aunts actually go for mammogram or screening even if they're educated they will not do it because it's a culture so that's why breast cells exam cards work as magic and when I'm giving it when I'm in Kadalur when I'm in Chennai I'm giving it out in, in Tamil when I'm in Hyderabad in Telugu when I'm in Bombay I'm giving it out in Marathi so that way you know this works like magic but then that was a surface level outreach and screening camp. But now we are going deeper into individual villages, going to each household doing breast cancer, oral cancer, and cervical cancer too, because these are the top three cancer. And definitely oral cancer, you know, Northeast India is high. And then we adopted two villages in Assam. One is a Bhojpuri speaking village and one is a Manipuri community because that tobacco is at high rate. And tobacco, not only like, you know, we always forget tobacco in the developing countries, but that not only affects the oral in our mouth, but then the tobacco ingredients are going all across the body. And that is also like one of the major carcinogens that we're giving in our body. We also have patient treatment bucket. We're trying to help the underprivileged sectors and those who are, so we collaborate with Narayana Ridolaya and then we kind of help with the treatment of the patients and, and who, who really cannot afford. And our patient advocacy is a huge thing because for, for breast cancer hub, the advocates are the real pillars of strength. So I take the stories of the advocates and I talk about them during the session. Because when they speak that, okay, others are speaking about it, then women come up. They're like, why should we now shy to talk about it? So our advocates, our biggest strength, we publish their stories on our website. Everyone is welcome to be an advocate. Please come forward because you can help us to save lives. Then patient counseling, we give scientific counseling like uh, to the patients. We have a support group. We capture real-time interviews. I don't want to go uh, longer. So this is my last slide. And this is like we have the BCH ambassadors. And we have also started like BCH rings where we cover different type of cancer. So that is all what we are trying to do uh, through Breast Cancer Hub. And everyone is welcome to join. Um, you know, like everything is free here. But I would just like to, um, before ending, I, want, I would just want to give a nutshell one more time. So along with the key risk factors, the things that we really, really need to capture is taboo and ignorance. Because that is the root cause and that will really help to avert untimely deaths in the developing countries, which is like significantly higher compared to the developed countries. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, keep, uh, to speak up about this and uh, saying uh, thank you uh, before signing off. I just want to say two words, break the breast taboo and together we save lives. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lopa, and all force to the great work you are doing. And yes, the take home message is breaking the silence and then we can break the cancer. So I think Thank that's you. great. And I think we need, we need more such groups and more people to do that. Thank you very much for that. And now, last but not the least, we, we have with us Brett Miller from the Male Breast Cancer Coalition. Uh, Brett, we are really curious to know about uh, this coalition. And uh, as we normally connect breast cancer with women. Well, yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Coming to you from Kansas City, Missouri. You can see my mom, Peggy's in the back. And uh, yeah. uh, our Hi. baby. Hello, Hello Peggy. Hi. Welcome. Uh, yes. Hello, Peggy. Daughter, Riley's back there. Yeah. Um, so I am, uh, I'm currently 34 years old. I am coming up on my 10-year um, uh, cancerversary. Um, I was 24 when I was officially diagnosed with breast cancer um, and I was 17 when I first found uh, my lump. Uh, it was seven years that it uh, 
you know, either going to doctors or not going to doctors, not having health insurance, um, you know, through college and then getting out of uh, college and, and getting a job, getting health insurance, but not having any symptoms, not really having any symptoms that I knew of um, that, that, that made me think that it was breast cancer. And not at any point until I was actually diagnosed and been told, you have breast cancer, did I think that I had breast cancer? I had a lump under my right nipple, um, and about a year and a half to two years before I was actually diagnosed with breast cancer, um, there was a yellow orangish discharge from the nipple if I were to squeeze it or bump up against uh, you know, a corner or something and hit it. Um, had I known that the, that the discharge was a, a, a major symptom, like a number one or number two, well, it's actually number two when I saw it. Number one was if you have a lump. Number two was uh, uh, discharge and then dimpling of the skin and, 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 all, and all those other um, symptoms. Um, I would have probably been on this a little bit earlier, but uh, you know, when I was 17, I, was to I went to two different doctors and I was told that it was a uh, calcium buildup. It would dissipate and go in way I was going through puberty. This is two different doctors. They didn't know each other. They didn't know, you know, it wasn't in my records of, of past thing. It was kind of one of those things that the first one saw and just kind of brushed it off. Um, so when I was officially diagnosed, um, after one doctor just took the lump out um, and, you know, everything that he told me, uh, his whole process of everything, I wanted a second opinion just to make sure that what he was saying wasn't just, you know, his opinion and, and not having any research behind it. Um, so the second doctor was fairly close to what the first doctor was, but was much better in that bedside manner. Um, he was much more open um, to, to different uh, uh, procedures. Um, and, you know, and, and talking to that doctor and, uh, you know, just the, what he was telling me that he had performed the surgery on 12 men before um, my surgery, that, that was more reassuring than the other doctor who hadn't performed on a male before. Um, but the fact that the surgeon, Dr. Lon McCroskey, told me that he had performed the surgery on 12 men before, but those men didn't speak out. Those men took time off work, had the surgery, recovered, went back to work like nothing ever happened. Um, but in, 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 our, in our talks, if, if I was comfortable about sharing my story, he felt that I could um, change the world, that I could put, be a face to male breast cancer. Um, you know, this is within the first meeting, so the first 20, 30 minutes of talking to this doctor, and he sees that in me. Um, you know, so it's something that I, I, I think about. I go meet with a plastic surgeon to see if there's an option on uh, even doing a reconstructed for a male, hearing from him that they, he doesn't, you know, he hasn't performed one. He's not sure if it's possible, but he would definitely look into it. Um, you know, the second time kind of hearing that I'd be like a, a, a guinea pig, a test subject for a doctor, I didn't really feel comfortable with that. So at that moment with that surgeon is when I, uh, is when I decided that, you know, I'm not doing any, re any reconstructive. I'm keeping the scar and everything where, where it will be once it's done. But that I'm taking my my doctors up on his uh, on on what he told me, and that I'm going to start speaking out. So I started I started with a Facebook post to uh, friends and family on there, letting everybody know that I've been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, although it is rare in men, it does happen. Um, you know, there, there's you know all these different procedures that I'll have to go through and treatments, but you know, at the end, you know, I I will be okay and. At that point is when we started the Brett Miller One T Foundation, um, and you know the main purpose of that was to to speak to the youth. Um, because I was 17 when I first found the lump, and then 24 diagnosed, that you need to be your uh, your own best advocate for your body. You need to know your body, so you need to do self exams, whether it's breast self exams uh, for men, testicular tests. Um, you need to be your own best advocate. And if you feel something different in your body, you need to go get a, go to a doctor and get that checked. And if that doctor tells you, Oh, it's nothing, don't worry about it. But you still have that feeling that no, no, it's something wrong with it. Go to another doctor, get a second opinion, third opinion, so on, whatever. 
you're your own best advocate, know your body. If you feel something, go get it checked out. So that's how the foundation started. And I started sharing my story. I lost track on how many news reports and, and interviews and, and uh, magazine articles I did within the first year of being diagnosed. Um, but it just, it, 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 it got so big that, you know, it, it, I couldn't stop. So, you know, we, in 2014, correct? Okay. Um, everything, you know, chemo brain, I'll, I'll pull that card out. Um, it, you know, it, we started the Male Breast Cancer Coalition um, with uh, Sherry Ambrose, who's my co-founder. She's from New Jersey. Um, she had seen firsthand with one of her very, very good friends um, how men were treated uh, when, you know, you get diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, you know, a few of the things that we were, we heard were, um, Susan G. Komen for one was that Susan didn't even have a brother. So uh, we don't know what that had to do with me being diagnosed and then not helping men out, at least locally. I know other chapters have been different, but we were kind of pushed off from then. The Young Survivors Coalition told us that they only deal with women. So, you know, we figured we had to do something to help men out. Um, we had to make sure that when you hear the words, you have breast cancer as a male, you're not alone. Um, so that's where the Male Breast Cancer Coalition is. Um, we're a platform for men to come together, um, to share their stories, to have somebody to talk to, um, to let them know that they have a place where they can go and not feel like an outsider um, being the only male in a breast cancer support group. Um, they, you know, they have, they have a brotherhood now that they can share their story with and, 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 and have, uh, resources. Um, we may not have the financial backing, uh, but as my mom says, we have heart and, uh, and together we will change the world. So that's, uh, that's kind of our, uh, our mantra and, uh, and that's, that's, that's kind of what it is. And does anybody have any questions? Uh, mom, do you want to jump in on anything? Yeah. Rep put it in a nutshell, and we're here for all the men out there in the world. Um, they reach out 24-7 through Facebook, social media. Thank God for social media. It's how they find us, and they realize they're not alone. And, you know, Brett works a full-time job, has a, a young, my first granddaughter, who we were even told then that he probably never fathered a child. And then we have one. So don't, I tell the men every day, don't give up. Don't think you can't have a, a life after cancer, because you can. You just have to be the one to make sure you do. It's not a death sentence. And we talk day in and day out. But globally, we can help change the world. And that's what we try to do daily. Thank you very much. Thank you. And yes, indeed, we can change the world. And thank you for your inspiring words, Peggy. Really, you have just pulled us up. Uh, there is a lot of light in the darkness. And thank you for spreading it. Yes, thank you very much. Please thank stay with us. Thank you. And we now open for the question and answer session. And uh, participants, please raise your virtual hand to ask your question or type in your question in the chat box. And it is all about breaking the silence. So I would like questions to be coming from the men and women as well, both of them. So I think this is our chance, but our chance to uh, sort of uh, uh, do something about this. We already have a, a few questions with us, but I'm just asking you to type in because uh, we are already, we have already short of time. We have, I think we have crossed time, but quickly, there is a one question from Anjali Sunil who wants to know, she says there is research, uh, perhaps some research that suggests that milk products are responsible for causing breast cancer in women. Is there any merit to this claim? Uh, would uh, our two specialists like to answer? Lopa Mudra? Uh, so there has been... Yes, there was... Uh, no, we can't hear you now. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Now you can hear yes, me? Yes, 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 yes. 
So, um, you know, there has been, um, I mean, there's a lot of research going on, but um, that's why in US also people have started to go more into vegan diet. But I, I did a lot of studies because I got many questions on this, but I'm still not convinced to come to that conclusion yet. So, you know, like I would definitely get uh, Dr. Pooja's, um, you know, like opinion too. But uh, anytime I get to know about this, I would definitely like, like to convey the message to you. So if there is a common platform where we can interact, please let me know because um, I really love um, Anjali, Miss Anjali's question. So there's a lot of study going on, but till now I'm still not confident to believe because there's a lot of pros and cons studies. Like some say it doesn't, some say it does. So I won't be able to say yet now, but I can do more research on this and get back to you if you give any contact where I can get in touch with you. But Dr. Pooja, I would like to hear yeah. from you. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Lok Pramudra, yeah, you are right in your way. And there are a lot of studies against the milk. And uh, the problem with the milk is first, it is an animal product. It is other species product. So people uh, say that vegan diet is better and we should not go for any animal-based product. It is rich in fat and carbohydrates. That is a problem with milk, which is linked to indirectly with cancers. So that way people say there's full fat milk and there is uh, toned milk, which has got 50% fat or lesser fat. So toned milk is better, it is more rich in calcium. But then because being an animal product, it has got certain those links. So that way people are avoiding milk nowadays. So yeah. it is just that way. So that's what I said. Whatever we drink or eat or we have, we should know everything about that product. From where it is coming, what is the source, how much carbs it has, how much fat it has, whether it is a good fat or it is a bad fat, saturated or unsaturated, how much protein it has. So that way we understand what we eat in a better way. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Nivedita. Nivedita, would you like to ask your question yourself? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, yeah. Ma'am, uh, ma actually, this is a question to Lopa, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned that arthritis can speed up the progression of breast cancer, but my doubt is if there's a woman who has uh, arthritis, is she more likely to get breast cancer? As in, like, would she have a higher yeah. risk of getting it? Right. Very good question. So no. So we, our study didn't find anything like that. So we also had another group where we had like with arthritis, but it was not like, you know, if you are having arthritis and your chances of getting breast cancer is higher. No, it's not that. But when you have arthritis and if you get breast cancer at that time, like we have to be very careful and target the inflammation. That should be also one of our primary goals along with targeting cancer. But if we have arthritis, if it can, um, whether a woman suffering from arthritis has a higher risk, no, we haven't found that yet. Okay, ma'am, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from Rahul Sharma from Hyderabad. Uh, he says, in Hyderabad, I have been to cancer awareness groups and breast cancer awareness groups, but never learned that men can have breast cancer too. So thank you, Brett, for bringing up that. And should men also do self-examination of the breast? Absolutely. Uh, this is Peggy. Yes, this is why Dr. Lopa Desroy and I band together. I do the graphics. She helps get the translation to show men they need to do a monthly check also. It is very important. Most men find their own cancer. The doctors don't. But the biggest problem is, is even when they go to the doctors, the doctors tell them it's nothing. Don't worry about it. That's not true. Like Brett said, you need to be your own best advocate. If you feel something's wrong, keep going to a doctor that might know about men and breast cancer. Yes, it's a small group, but it really truly isn't. I talk to weekly on the average three to four men all being diagnosed with breast cancer. Lots of it is environmental. Brett himself, we don't carry the genes in our family, but I have 12 women with breast cancer, including Brett and Anise. So we don't know what's causing it in our family and neither does the medical professionals, but someday we might find that out. So you have to be your own best advocate, especially men. 
Thank you. Yeah, and uh, also I can add over here that, you know, Mr. Rahul, so I have been traveling to India extensively, right? And I met so many oncologists who told me that, uh, and I, I can give you an example in Assam, like um, an oncologist told me in the last two years or three years, she had six male breast cancer patients all diagnosed late and they are no more. So this data is not coming out. That is my concern. You know, that's why I'm pushing and pushing so that, you know, we can bring that data out. But definitely, as Peggy said, we have built uh, in 17 languages now. Please download and circulate in your network. And um, it's all available. It's like free to download. Free to print and download and share with anyone digitally. Uh, BreastSelfExams.org, it sits on that website, but also both on Breast Cancer Hub and Male Breast Cancer Coalition. There are tabs for it. So use it, share it, give it to anyone. Men have to start being their own best advocates because we're training the world that men have breasts too. And that's what the world needs to realize. And in fact, in men, there is less of fat compared to women in the breast. So the cancer spreads quickly to the muscles and it spreads very fast compared to women. In women, yes, the more, fat is, is protective. So that also is a difference. Yes, more of our men are metastatic stage four mm -hmm. before they're diagnosed because they didn't know they had it. And that's the problem. Yes. And, and more, of our, more men in the United States breast cancer if the doctors start checking men's breast in a physical just like they do women imagine the lives that would be saved that's all i can say so when a man finally goes to a doctor they need to ask their doctor for a breast exam because the doctors are not doing it uh, doctor, uh, thank you, thank you, Peggy. Uh, doctor Ramakant, are there any uh, documented cases of uh, uh, breast cancer in men in India? Or uh, are yes, we... yes, there there are many. Actually, we see around five hundred female breast cancers in a year, mm -hmm. and we may see five or six less than ten male mm -hmm. breast cancers in a year. So, and if you see ADR Institute, they have published separately for male breast cancers. The the treatment is the same; it's not different. But mm -hmm. there are certain differences. Like I said, males, the fat is not there. So it's quickly spread to the muscles. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of published literature. But obviously, it is less in men. So it is less talked about. In women, it has become the most common cancer. That is why it is talked so much about it. But that doesn't mean that we don't talk about men. That also is there. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, another question says that, 50 missing screening by 50 percent missed screening by mammogram is a lot. So, do we have better diagnostics, or is there need for better diagnostics, Doctor Lopa? Yes. So, uh, so what I meant with 50 percent is missed when we have like 50 percent of the cases with dense breast. Mm -hmm. So, when we have like usually mammogram will catch two. Tumor, if our body tissue is mostly fatty tissue, but if we have dense breast and if the tumor is also localized in that area, then there are chances to get missed. And nowadays in US, what they do is when we go for a mammogram, the doctors are suggesting a 3D mammogram. You know, not the regular mammogram because the resolution is better. Or else, also like once uh, I myself had to go through mammogram three times in US, and then finally they did an ultrasound on me. And in India, I know ultrasound is definitely an option everywhere so and so the supplementary test can be ultrasound with mammogram for sure okay. All right. uh, uh, dr premjit would you like to ask your question ma'am you please carry on yes you can ask your question yourself please okay okay ma'am thank you ma'am thank you very much uh, uh, Dr. Roy, it's uh, very good to, uh, it's a pleasure to talk your uh, things and then it's a very nice presentation. Can I interrupt uh, in between, Dr. Prindit? I would like you to introduce yourself, please. Uh, uh, Ma'am, uh, actually, I'm a not doctor, I'm a microbiologist. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I am uh, uh, myself, Prindit Thompson, so I'm the co founder and the president of the, one of these state level organizations, Sangayu Tobacco Free and Education Organization. Uh, we are working for the last uh, 2013 in the Manipur state and then I was working in the CTFK in the partners with the Baha also. 
and that's all i mean i have the, this much experience so after all we i am the member uh, we are the member of the state level coordination committee government of manipur ntcp and then we are the member of the aftc mumbai also so we are working very hardly in the tobacco control so anyway the Roy, I would like to ask uh, one thing. What is your opinion? I mean, nowadays, I mean, 8 million people are using tobacco products all over the world. So what is your opinion, I mean, with this tobacco product uses with the bread cancers during this COVID-19 pandemic situation? Okay, so you are asking me like tobacco with breast cancer, right? I would yes. say tobacco is a no-no for any type of cancer because that is the root cause like in india definitely oral cancer you know like the saddest part is in us the oral cancer is not in the top 10 but in india and other places where tobacco is the oral cancer is in the top 10 and also we should not forget that i know that we think that with all tobacco nothing to do with the breast but it's carcinogen you're putting inside your body you know from the tobacco the ingredient is going through the bloodstream and going to all the parts of the body so wherever the susceptible, the breast tissues are very susceptible. So this can be one of the causes too, like for having like, you know, breast cancer. So, you know, so any type of cancer, I would say tobacco, even with breast cancer is definitely a no-no. And smoking is also like, it is being studies have shown that smoking, which is also another like tobacco getting in our body, right? Smoking also causes an upregulation with breast cancer for sure. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have a question from Sartaj Singh. Sartaj, would you like to ask your question? Sartaj. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, yeah, so this question is for uh, Dr. Roy. So I saw the uh, incredible images of the work that you have been doing on ground level in the rural areas of India. That's Sorry, really I can't hear you. Would you be able to? OK, do you have your question typed? OK, yes, I, so I can. For I some can reason, read. my laptop uh, audio is not working that good. So Mr. Sh Sartaj, is this your question? I saw the incredible images of the awareness that doctor. Is this your question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, is doing it where arguably there are a lot of taboo or rather stigma, especially what is the way we can create mass evil? Okay, so this is a great question. So you know what I do is so my dad uh, he was a pediatrician. He just passed away in twenty uh, second February. My dad always had one mantra that breast milk is the best thing for the baby immunity. So what I do is when I go to these rural areas, and even trust me, even the urban areas society is very difficult to bring them to on the same page to speak up. So what I say is that how do you, from where do you give your babies the best gift a mom can give is from the breast milk. So if the breast milk is the best gift you're giving your baby, then why are you so shy to speak about it if something goes wrong in your breast? And I think that really helps. So, you know, there's a lot of taboo, I know, but when you bring the reality into picture, when you talk about male breast cancer, then men becomes involved too. And that has really helped me to break the taboo. And also like when we give the inspiring stories of the survivors. Because I take the permission of the advocates, I talk about breast story everywhere, you know, like in you know, other MBCC brothers stories. I talk about our survival stories from breast cancer. Up and when I show it to them, the women come forward. So this can really create a mass awareness and also the social media, because you know you can share through social media. Like um, in, so I would say that the places where I went, because I give my WhatsApp number everywhere I go, and we have saved like I think I reached out to more than fifty thousand or sixty thousand women population, and I think we saved around five thousand lives were detected early. Like because of this outrage, because the channels, TV channels came forward when they saw this, they did the interviews, those were broadcast. And the reason I know is I get the phone call, my WhatsApp number is open to everyone, and that's how I get to know. So these are the ways I think where I will be there are a lot of taboo, stigma, but we can create mass awareness by bringing those three things into picture for sure. I can guarantee you this, because I have done this. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Shyam Sundar. His internet connection is weak. So he wants me, he has written his question there uh, to me, but uh, he says, uh, this is a question regarding male breast cancer. Do hormonal imbalances, especially the ones in puberty like uh, gynecomastia, increase the risk of breast cancer in male? 
ये ये डेफिनेटली गायनेकोमेस्टिया वन ऑफ द रिस्क फैक्टर्स फॉर ब्रेस्ट कैंसर इन मेल्स इट इज इट इज डेफिनेटली देयर ओके वी हैव अनदर क्वेश्चन फॉर डॉक्टर रमाकांत फ्रॉम निर्मला गुप्ता शी सेज यू कम फ्रॉम अ वेरी बिग गवर्नमेंट हॉस्पिटल वर ब्रेस्ट वाज ब्रेस्ट कैंसर केयर अफेक्टेड ड्यूरिंग द कोविड 19 लॉकडाउन and is there any link you see in your clinical work between covid 19 and breast cancer yes nirmala you have raised a very important concern and we had lot of uh, problems managing breast cancer patients though we never stopped our opd even a single day we took all the protective measures but we didn't close down and we kept seeing the patients but patients found it difficult to come there was no public conveyance so those who had their personal vehicles to come they could come you won't believe it people drove cycle and they came 100 and 300 kilometers away to take chemotherapy i still remember one patient who walked 50 kilometers started in the morning 4 o'clock reached 10 o'clock am 10 am in our opd just to show us and then he will walk back and go back with that lady with the breast cancer after one hour again he will walk for 5 6 hours so we used to ask patients how they are coming if they find it difficult to come we were switching chemotherapies which are given iv instead of we were giving tablet form of chemotherapies so that they don't have to come to hospital so we were trying to cut down their hospital visits as much as we can we had started digital opds we had a duty mobile dedicated to their attending their calls and we were getting hundreds of calls every day and we were trying to manage on phone all those patients who didn't had a problem in coming and they didn't had problems related to chemotherapies or they were deemed for surgery we took them for surgery so surgeries for cancer patients were not stopped so that way treatments were modified a bit depending on patient from where the patients are coming and what is their convenience but every patient had lot of problems because first the covid test has to be done that report comes after 24 yeah. hours so patients have to stay in the holding area so there were a lot of hassles and still there are but with the ease things are becoming becoming better off but definitely all care was affected because of covid okay uh, um, we have a question from isha garg and uh, she says that are there any awareness programs going on at school level for best cancer awareness and i think uh, lopa mudra has answered that that they she is carrying out a lot many school programs but dr pooja ramakant what about the situation here more in india and are there enough school awareness or do programs or would you suggest more programs of these types no sure madam we want to do but uh, still it is just the tip of the iceberg school programs are not really happening the way they should be happening and awareness program should be happening much more but unfortunately it is not happening mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so we need to work on this area and there's lot of a- scope to work in this area very selected the say schools may be doing it and it is just the tip of the iceberg schools which are happening okay uh, just one last request for the participants if you have any more questions because we have already overshot the time i think by 20 minutes so i would like to wrap up now but any last minute questions please put them up quickly and uh, 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 there is a com- uh, com- comment commendable salutes to you frontline doctors and uh, dr ramakan not a single day opd was closed is a very positive example from a government major hospital and uh, some doctors are not so sensitive hope there are more like you and uh, with this uh, we come to the end of today's discussion Uh, and in, uh, thanks to all our panelists, uh, and special thanks to Brett and Peggy for their ve- uh, sharing of their very powerful learning for us. And in today, yes, in today's SDG talks, co-hosted by Indian Institute of Management Indore and CNS, we were listening to Dr. Pooja Ramakan, Dr. Lopa Mudra Das, Peggy Miller, Brett Miller, and uh, the sharing of story. also by our friend uh, we will meet again tomorrow on may, 23rd may at 3 pm to listen to professor dr surikan on lung health tobacco and covid 19 bye till then and stay safe 
Uh, sincere thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.